Now, the apostles, just to kind of give you a background on this word, the church had been birthed. There had been people healed and saved and set free. It was growing daily, growing exponentially. The apostles had been arrested two or three times, and they went back out on the streets and taught the word. They were doing many signs and wonders. There was a great fear in Jerusalem because of the power that they walked in. And Christians who had become Christians went and sold their houses and their farms and all of their property, and they laid it at the apostles' feet, and they were living communally. In other words, that they had turned into a sort of a sort of a commune or kibbutz, kibbutz like the modern Jewish kibbutz would be. And so, and so they were doing this because the Holy Spirit directed them to do this because they knew the Romans were going to confiscate all their property. So they they were holding everything in common. And so this is the this is kind of sets this story up here. In verse 1 says, But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart, and why have you not lied to men but to God? And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose, and they wrapped him up, and they carried him out, and they buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. And then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out and buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. And then I'm going to drop down to verse 13. And it says, Yet none of the rest of the people dared join them, but the people esteemed them very highly. My God had his blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seen it. So this passage has never made any sense to me in the sense that what, is, what has begun here? What has begun is the church, the age of grace, the age of forgiveness, the age of redemption, the age of, yeah, you made a mistake, but... You confess your sins, he cleanses you of all unrighteous effects, and you get to start again. And what we get in this passage is two people that lied to the Holy Spirit, and God killed them for it. How do we reconcile that with the age of grace? I want to, I'm going to explain it to you, if you'll bear with me, what the Lord has revealed to me about this. Number one, we have to understand where we are in history. Just like Ananias and Sapphire did not understand where they were in history. And we need to understand where we are in history. We need to get a revelation that we're entering into the new era of glory. Kimberly recommended a book to me. She said, Tim Sheets, the brother of Dutch Sheets, has written a book called The New Era of Glory. You need to get it and read it because it's what you've been preaching for years. And so I got it and I read it and I go, my God, I could have wrote, written this book. And Tim is calling the church and he, January the 4th at Chuck Pierce's church, he preached a message to the new ecclesia, the rising remnant church that you need to get, go on the internet, you need to listen to it and hear it. Because he's calling the church to quit wringing its hands and hiding from the reality of the culture, and step up and be the church of Jesus Christ. And there's a new era. God is releasing a new era of glory in this time. And you remember four years ago, the Lord gave us this word out of Haggai 2.9 when he, when he talks about, he said, speak to the remnant in Haggai 2. And he said, he said, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. God said the church, the, the church that's rising, the remnant church, those are those that have not abandoned the word of God, that have not abandoned the truth of the word, that have stayed faithful, even though they ordain homosexuals in some of the church and they teach the homosexual lifestyle is a wonderful, fine way to live. And I love homosexuals. I'm not against them, but it's a sin according to the word of God. And I'm going to live by the word of God. And there's certain things about the word of God I don't understand. I just read you Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11. I don't understand that. But I know there's something in there for me. 
I know that I need to try to live by it even if I don't understand it. I can't make my own standard. You can't create your own standard of moral truth. You have to live by this one. And so, and so in, this, in this time, uh, the, the, the church that's remained faithful has begun to arise. The remnant church is rising up. They remain set apart from the world. That's the definition of holiness, is to be different than the world, to be not common. This church has been transformed in around the government model of the book of Acts, too. This is the other thing, too. This church has got a different, it's, 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 it's a totally different organization. It operates under apostolic authority. There's an alignment in the church happening today in America and in the rest of the world where churches are lining up under apostolic authority. This is why the church is so vibrant in China and so vibrant in Africa and so vibrant in all these places is that, is that those churches were created under and remain lined up under apostolic authority. The pastor of these churches is a vision carrier and he's a spiritual son to an apostle. The elders in these churches are wise men. They're a committee of wise men that are well-versed in the word and they're, they're, they give good counsel to the pastor in the pursuit of his vision. And these churches have deacons who are servants to the people. They don't run the church. They're servants to the people. And these churches are supported in their ministry by the office of prophet and the office of evangelist. They have prophets who come regularly and speak the word, the, the God's heart into the congregation and evangelists come and stir the church up in revival. They're built around the Ephesians 4.11 five-fold ministry model. These new churches, these remnant churches that are winning souls, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, and healing the sick. This is their raising of the Acts 2 church, which was prophesied by my spiritual father and mentor, Brother Jim, told me near his deathbed, he said, you will see the Acts 2 church rise again in your lifetime. And I'm here to tell you I'm seeing it with my own eyes right now. The remnant church rising. It started to have a tremendous impact on society, wherever it goes, wherever it is. These people are baptized in the Holy Spirit. They perform and walk in signs and wonders. Acts 2, 4, 43 and 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all of the people. This was a model that John Wesley discovered in the, in the 18th century that the Acts 2 church followed. The ecclesia in China, in Africa, in South America, in Latin America, in, in, in Australia, in all of these places where you see this magnificent, vibrant remnant church rising meets in the temple. They worship together, but then they go into small groups and they meet house to house. And they have favor even with the lost people because they've seen so many miracles. Listen, when your baby's sick, you ain't got time to learn theology. You just got to have a miracle. When you're in Africa where there's no doctors and there are no hospitals and you have an Ebola virus break out, you got to have a miracle. You haven't got time to wait on building buildings and, and doing all of this stuff. China needs to lay down. Have you seen that picture of all those, all those track, track hoes out there working to build hospitals to keep all these sick people in? Let me tell you what they need to do. They need to get on their knees and pray. Amen. That no pestilence shall draw near, near thy dwelling. They need to take a stand on the word. Many of them are. Watch what I'm telling you. Listen to me. The Chinese epidemic will stop just as fast as it started because the Chinese church is praying. You don't hear about that on television because they're underground, but they're praying and they're fasting and they're binding and they're loosing and they have authority and the keys to heaven. And I'm telling you, as it is in heaven, so shall it be on earth. And that which is loosed in heaven, it'll be loosed on the earth and healing will come and it will stop one day as fast as it started. And they're going to have all this money spent on these vacant buildings and pigeons are going to be flying in and out the windows because they don't need them anymore. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then see what happens. Come on, somebody. So, the ecclesia of Matthew 16, we talked about it last week. That on this rock I'll build my church. The word there was ecclesia. It doesn't mean like our common thought of church today. It's a legislative body. 
where a small portion of the population was extracted and in the Democrat, it existed. When Jesus used the word, it existed in the Greek form of government, Greek democracy. It was about 10% of the overall population. And they were empowered to make decisions about what was culturally appropriate for that organization. They'd made decisions about declarations of war. They made decisions about government leaders. They made decisions about the direction of the nation because they had the spirit of God and they could see things as they really were. And everybody else was blinded by, this is Jesus' plan, everybody else who's blinded because they're not seeing spiritually would just respect them. I just read you in the book, an ax, they carried two dead bodies out and everybody goes, whoa, man, I ain't joining them, but I sure have a lot of respect for them because they prayed for my nephew and he got a heal. They had enormous cultural influence. Enormous. That's what the war was about. That's why the Pharisees were after them because they were stealing their cultural influence. This is what the ecclesia was supposed to be. It's supposed to be a ruling, governing body of people who have insight to and understand the times and what the nation ought to do. I got a word from the Lord as I studied for this lesson. He said, listen to this. You can write this down if you want to. In this decade of speaking, in this decade of speaking and decreeing, the remnant church will recover its status as the moral authority over all social issues. Ten years from now, the church will become the ecclesia. Within ten years. You're going to see it in your lifetime. But in the first, and the reason that we're going to win is because the Holy Spirit, we still have the Holy Spirit. The reason we're going to win is God is not tired. He's not a man that he should relent. He's not giving up. The reason that we're going to win is that from the beginning of the ordained before, before but the ordination of the ages is, is that we win. The worst thing we can do is give up and say, Jesus, come back and get us. That's not what he wants to hear right now. He wants to hear, where are you taking ground for my kingdom? Where are you having influence in the seven mountains of influence of commerce and entertainment and media and, and education and family and all of those? Which one of those mountains are you staked out? Where are you having influence for the kingdom? Because that's all that matters in this recovery, this recovery of the ecclesia's role in society to be the, the minority group that decides what's good for everybody. Come on, somebody. The Holy Spirit's still working. But in this time of this new era of glory, we're going to notice a couple of things. You ready for this? Number one, an escalation of spiritual warfare. There's going to be an escalation of spiritual warfare, a heightened level of warfare at every level in your personal life. Has anybody noticed an increase of spiritual warfare in your personal life? Hallelujah. Two of you and the rest of you lying. <laughs> also in your profession, I'm convinced that in America, the idol of mammon is going to really war with Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And so many of you are in jobs and doing things because you're good people and you try to take care of your family and I love you for it and so does God. But the job has got you bound. And you can't pursue Jesus because you ain't got time. You can't come to church because you ain't got time. You can't go to a small group because you haven't got time. And you're working yourself to death and you're just like a hamster on a treadmill and you're just barely staying up. The call to you is to get off the treadmill. Do something brave. Trust God. Say, God, I have to have a financial door opened because I can't live in bondage to the system anymore. I'm making a financial exodus out of man's system, and I'm entering into your promised land. I'm going to still work hard, but I'm going to work hard for Christian men and Christian women and Christian organizations that understand the importance of family, they understand the importance of, of church and spiritual pursuit, and I'm going to go to work there. That's where I'm going to work. No matter who it draws me to or tears me from, I'm going to change. I need a change. There's a warfare. The devil has me bound up, and I'm getting free from that. There's a warfare going on in your professional and your career. And finally, political and social. There is a huge world war going on politically in our nation. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So we got to, this is the last push before the parousia. This is the last push before the second coming of Jesus. 
This is the last push of harvest. And how long it's going to last, I have no idea. I just know the Reformed Church is going to win souls like crazy and make disciples. And that's going to be the difference. That we're going to conquer the seven mountains in Isaiah 2. 2 is going to be filled where it says the Lord's mountains shall rise above all the other mountains. The church will rise again to its prominence. It's going to happen in the next 10 years. That's what my word from the Lord is. And this is the new thing, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Roger alluded to it. God says, don't remember the former things. Forget about what church used to look like to you. Forget about that. Don't remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Because behold, I'm doing a new thing. Say, it's a new thing. And you have to learn to see from a position of new because he's making roads in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He's disrupting the natural order of things. And what used to be so impossible or so crazy to think about is actually going to happen. You're going to have a Congress that is saved and born again in the spirit of God in your lifetime. You're going to see it. You're going to see it in your lifetime. You're going to see things like no generation of Christians has ever seen, including the original apostles. You're going to see signs and wonders and miracles. The natural order of things is about to be disrupted because we're in a time of God's sovereign providence. Say providence. Providence. We're in a time of God's sovereign providence. Providence is God's guidance or divine intervention into the affairs of men. Listen, listen, God is a free will God because you can't have love if you don't have free will. If you, you, can't, you can't coerce people to love for you. You have to give them the right to choose whatever, even death and hell. You have to give them the right to choose that to, in, 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 to, to, come, to extract a population out of this age of grace that have proven that they choose you, Lord. They choose you over everything. Amen. That's who's going to go into eternity. That's who's going to go into heaven with him. And they have proven their faithfulness in this age of choice and free will. But there are times, there are times in history where God says the free will thing is not going to work today because I'm doing something sovereign. I'm doing something sovereign. It's providential. I'm invading their space because I will not let the devil defeat me. I'll do what I have to take to overcome the devil. And sometimes I got to take action. And today I'm having telling you, I'm here to tell you, God is saying, I'm taking action. Amen. I'm taking action today. In this time of sovereign providence, where God intervenes in the affairs of men, what triggers what triggers that? Because the truth of the matter is, if you understand any of the New Testament church, you understand it's about, it's about allowing free choice. It's about allowing people to do whatever they want to do. But if you go back and you look through the history of God's people, you'll see that there's the same thing. There's one thing that has always triggered an intervention, a time of God's sovereign providence over and over again in the history of God's people. God has moved sovereignly. And it's whenever his prophets and priests become profane. Jeremiah 23, 11, for both prophets and priests are profane. Yes, my, there's sin in my own house. Listen to me. You can, you can chase prostitutes and drink whiskey and do whatever you want to do. That's on you. And you can repent of that and you can get saved and you can get cleansed. But God's prophets and his priests are held to a higher standard. And when they start doing what the culture is doing, judgment begins to come in the house of God. And God begins to move sovereignly to correct the course of his church. And we're in the midst of that right now. When the prophets and priests start to call evil good and good evil, when they ordain homosexual priests, that's when God said, that's enough. I'm not against homosexuals. But man, if you can't live by a higher standard than that, you can't be a priest in the house of God. Can I get a witness out of somebody? I can't commit any kind of sexual sin. Listen to me. 
It don't make any difference if I'm having sex with the opposite sex. That's irrelevant. I can't commit fornication. I can't commit adultery. I can't commit any type of sexual sin. And when you turn the news on, what strikes me is all of these preachers of these big mega churches, and you find out they've been having a thing with their secretary. And I'm not judging nobody, and I know the devil can take out anybody. And I know the devil is always trying to set people up to fall in big love. But I'm telling you that the prophets and priests are profane. They're sin in my own house, God. God says, therefore, that's enough. I'm about to move sovereignly. This is what he did in Jeremiah chapter 23 and 24. That's when his intervention begins to manifest. He banished the Israelites to live in Babylon. And they had to remain there until the Smitas had been fulfilled. That's a whole different subject. Second Chronicles 36, 21. We'll go back to Jeremiah 23, 14 for a minute. God says, also, I have seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. They are also strengthened in the hands of evildoers so that no one turns back from this wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to me and inhabitants like Gomorrah. Listen, the people who commit sin, God goes, you're supposed to set an example of holiness. You're supposed to set an example and encourage them to turn back, not beat them over the head with the Bible, but encourage them. How many of you in here have, uh, there, are pe- there, are, there, are, there are couples in here that were living together at one time that were not married, and I did never beat them over the head with the word, but I kept telling you, if you want God's grace in your life, if you want that power force flowing through your life, Do what he asks you to do. And they have all responded. They have all gotten married in the eyes of God. And things are better in Jesus' name in their life. And that's what I'm selling. I'm selling a better life. I'm selling a way to overcome. And I'm so proud of you. I don't beat people over the head with truth. I love them into a revelation, gently showing them the ways of God are the best ways to go. And I can't compromise. I can't be having an affair with somebody and then sit up here and preach on adultery. God, I'm telling you. And it's okay. It's okay. Look, preachers are human. I know that. We said that a lot. We go, they're human. They are human, but they're held to a higher standard. Can I get a witness out of somebody? And they can trigger a move. They can trigger a sovereign move of God in society. If they don't repent, they legitimize, he said, illicit sex. They look the other way, sex outside of marriage. They ordain homosexual sin. Now God says, I'm going to move. And in 2 Chronicles, he drove the people off the land. They had to stay there. 2 Chronicles 36, 21, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. As long as she lay desolate, she kept a Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So this is a smita. This is every seven years they were supposed to rest the land that he gave them and not, and not plan anything. They failed to do it for 70 smitas. That's 490 years. They didn't keep a smita. And finally, God says, he drove them off the land and he left them off the land until those that, 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 that ordinance of his had been fulfilled. So what took God so long? Ecclesiastes 8.11. You need to write this one down. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. There's a time delay. There's a time delay between the time you commit sin and you start to harvest the effects of it. Why is there a time delay? Why is there a time delay between the time you commit a sin and the time you begin to manifest the effects of it in your life? It gives you time to what? To repent. If you, if you, if you confess and repent, he cleanses and forgives. This is the system of Christianity. Your sin's not okay. But you're given a way to deal with it. You're given a way to repent and change your direction. But when the prophets and the priests start to endorse it, now, now you've gone too far. It's over. God begins to move. When the prophets and priests become profane, God acts decisively. I want to show you some examples in the Bible. Look look at Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2. 
Nadab and Abihu were Aaron's boys, and they were ordained in the priestly order. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and he offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord, and he devoured them, and they died before the Lord. God killed them right there at the altar, fried them like french fries. This was, these were Aaron's boys. Not only was this authoring, this authoring was unauthorized. See, spiritual authority. The other thing about this dynamic church that's winning souls, healing people, raising the dead, making a difference, changing the destiny of nations, Dr. Francis Miles, who will be here July 26th. Amen. Dr. Francis Miles will tell you the story when he comes of his revelation on Speak to the Earth, which he introduced you to when you were here, how he introduced that into Zimbabwe. The churches begin to stand and believe on it. They begin to break curses, take authority over the darkness in their land. And now their, their, their dictatorial leader, who is a bloodthirsty guy, they, they arrested him peacefully, took him out of control, put a Christian guy in as president of the nation, turned the course of the nation's economy completely around, began to deliver people from poverty, raised up the name of Jesus, became a Christian nation where 85% of their people are, 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 are Pentecostal Christians, and they begin to see a, the complete change in the history of the nation. Amen. Because they operate that church on spiritual authority. They understand the principle and they live by it. This was unauthorized fire. Aaron is the one that decides when you make an offering. Not these boys. Even they were part of the priesthood. And there's some evidence that they were probably drunk. In Leviticus 9.10 just shortly after this incident, the Lord says to, the, to Aaron, he said, Don't, do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you or your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of the meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may distinguish between what is holy and what's unholy, between clean and unclean. This ordinance was given because they had not sanctified God and they had not had respect for him, and they had not seen him as holy, and so they staggered in there half drunk, slung some incense on the fire, on the altar, and God killed them. They had not followed the proper order. David, he tried to move the Ark of the Covenant in 2 Samuel 6, 3, 6 through 7. And so they set the Ark of God on a new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah, put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for an ox had stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there uh, for his error, and he died there before the ark. God killed him, and, and David got extremely offended about this because he was just trying to bring the ark into its tabernacle in Jerusalem where it belonged, and, and God kills a man. Why does he kill a man? He kills the man because no one had regard for the proper order. Because in Exodus chapter, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, 8, said at that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, to bless his name to this day. So basically he had, or, he had ordained the priest to bear the presence of God. And, and he had, no, he had no, no respect. David had no respect for that. And he called the priest and he said, look, man, a guy got killed. What are we going to do? And they said, do it right. Get rid of your ox cart. Let the priest do it the way God said to do it. This is such a good idea. In everything, it's such a good idea. It works so good. Just do it the way he said to do it. And he got the priest and they carried it into Jerusalem and they had no problems because they sanctified the Lord. And the Western church began to, this habit of this, I mean, began to ordain these uh, practicing homosexuals and rampant sin began to flow through the priesthood. His priests and prophets became profane. It's triggered this sovereign intervention. And free will right now doesn't really matter. God's doing something. Amen. And he's going to do it. And you can stand by and watch or be part of it, one of the two, but don't get in the way of it. Turn to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 and 15. This word is going around a lot. You'll hear this in a Christian community. There are several prophets that have brought this word to the church. And I want to give you some context on it. 
Joshua chapter 5, 13 and 15. They've just crossed over and they've just observed their first Passover. They observed the Passover, the manna dried up, and now they begin to live on the provision. You missed that. They observed the first Passover, the manna dried up, and they begin to live on the provision of the land. Passover will unrelease things in your life you never dreamed when you observe the Passover. And so they're about, they're, they're encamped by Jericho, this fortified city with these huge walls. They're about to start the Canaanite campaign and they don't know what to do next. Verse one, no, verse 13, I'm sorry. Verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and he looked and behold, a man, some versions say an angel, stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and he said to him, are you for us or are you against us? And the answer of the man, and the man said, no. He just said, no. He said, I am the commander of the armies of the angels of heaven of the Lord and I have now come. And Joshua, who's about to embark on a battle, he's thinking, man, this is really great. And he gets down on his face and he fell on his face to the earth and he worshiped and he said to him, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? He said, take your shoes off. Because this is holy ground. What? The, the question, see, the first thing you have to do is you have to ask the right question. The question is not, is God for you or is, or is he against you? The question is, are you for him? Are you interested in the will of God? Is that going to be the central part of your life? Is that what you're committed your life to? Is his will and what he's doing now. Chris Valvaton, a great preacher at Bethel, had this vision and in the vision, God was, and this moved me because I had a similar vision to this. I told you all about it with the angels surrounding the hill land. But this, in this vision, God was moving with, with, with intention down this path. And everything, everybody that was getting in the way, he would grab them and throw them out of the way and grab them and throw them away. And he was just moving with intention. And Chris was next. And he looked up and his and God, they locked eyes. And Chris goes, I was frozen for a minute. I was in the path and I was frozen for a minute. And God started moving towards me and I realized if I didn't get out of the way, he was going to throw me out of the way. So I stepped to the side. And when God got past me, he looked at me and said, now get behind me and follow. In this time of a sovereign move, this is no time for you to be, this is no time to be wishy-washy with your commitment to the king. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Listen, Peter, Peter asked, he asked Ananias, he said, did you lie to the Holy Spirit? What's Peter? Peter lied three times just a few chapters before that. What gives him the right to judge Ananias? Who in here has never told a lie? Thank you. You have a bad, bad spirit of deception on you. <laughs> Somehow I knew you were going to raise your hand. If you can get your mother to cooperate that, we'll give you some sort of a medallion or something. <laughs> and yet at this time, Peter lied three times. He denied Christ three times. What about Saul? Saul went out in, in 2 Samuel and he went out on the mission of the Lord and he was supposed to take the Malachites and destroy all of their livestock and not take anything for spoil, but he brought the livestock back, the best of the livestock. And when Samuel caught him, when the prophet Samuel caught him, he said, what are you doing? You were supposed to kill all the livestock. And he said, oh, we're just keeping the best of it to make an offering. Liar. <laughs> Samuel said, quit lying. He said, God prefers obedience over sacrifice anyway. Because the sin of rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And God, but God didn't kill Saul. This is my point. God didn't kill Saul. He just took his spirit off of him and no longer he had the, did he have the anointing to be king. And God let it, put it on a 14-year-old boy in a sheepfold named David and he eventually became king. But Saul suffered. He killed himself on the battlefield. He went crazy. He went insane because he didn't have the connection to God anymore. And, you know, his life was bad, but God didn't kill him. How come he killed Ananias and Sapphira? There's a time. There's a time when God is doing a sovereign move. 
And if you're in the way, you're toast. There's a time when you have to decide, I'm all in with God or I'm all out. Because if you allow yourself to become an obstacle to what God is doing, then I will guarantee you they'll carry you out of a body bag. Let me tell you, in Congress in Washington, D.C., the impeachment is going to stop. And going to be, there's going to be a darkness that's going to be exposed. And there's going to be a lot of political dead bodies before this is over. And you can write this down. Thus saith the Lord. I, they're in my way. They have made themselves an obstacle to this sovereign move where I'm restoring the moral authority of the church in society. And they have made themselves an obstacle to that and they, it's too late. Free will won't work. They can't think about it. They can't pray about it. They can't decide. They get carried out in a political body bag. Their careers are over. Because when God is moving this way, you can, you can lie to him before when Peter did and you can lie to him after but you can't lie to him in the middle of the move because he's in the midst of a sorting. There's a tremendous sorting going on in the church, in society, in me personally, in you personally. God is shaking everything. He said, I'm gonna shake everything that can be shaken. And now, yeah. You got some unholy stuff in your life? You know what it needs to go? Out the window. You know I don't preach this kind of stuff. I'm not a hellfire and brimstone preacher, but I'll tell you this, God is asking me, he said, I'm saying, are you friend or are you foe? And he's saying, take your shoes off. Get yourself right. He told Moses the same thing at the burning bush. He said, Lord, is that you? Lord, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. See, when, you get, when God is moving this way, the only thing that's important is that you're living a sanctified life that you've given it all to him. That doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. And I'm, saying that, I'm not saying that when, when your horse bucks you off, you can't cuss a little. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you make yourself an obstacle to what God is intentionally doing, you won't survive very long. Can I get a witness out of somebody? And this is where we are. And the prophets and the priests have caused God to resort to this. Take your shoes off. Get yourself right. Translation. What I want you to do is to understand this is a sovereign move. You don't even have to try to figure it out. You're just caught up in it. And the wisest thing you can do is to distinguish between what's holy and unholy and to follow me and the holiness. So this sorting... In Acts chapter 5, God was trying to establish the apostolic order, the authority of the apostolic in his church. And these were part of that group and they were half-hearted. They laid there and it wasn't about the money. See, this is why it's not about the money. If they had come and said, we're, you know, we're scared, our faith's not where it ought to be. So we're holding a little back. How many of you have been holding a little back? God wouldn't have killed them for that. It's when they tried to trick God and the rest of them into believing that they were all in when they weren't all in. The Holy Spirit knew that they were going to lose their property anyway. And Ananias and Sapphira, that what the sin that killed them is they lied to the Holy Spirit. Can I, can I make a recommendation? Yeah, don't do that. You can, you can lie to me, and I don't care. I love you anyhow. I can tell a lot bigger than yours anyway. I'm good at it. I don't care about that. I'm not judging you one minute, but do not lie to God. In this time of a sovereign move, if you've got a sin issue in your life, I want to encourage you when we take communion, come up here and just deal with it. It ain't nothing on me. I don't care. I do not care. I'm so busy worried about my own sin issues, I ain't got time to worry about yours. It's not about that. It's about you getting your life lined up during this time of this sovereign move when God will freight train you if you're not all in. This has not been an easy message for me to preach. This is not my nature. But this is no time to lie to God. You can lie to him before. Maybe you already have. I forgive you. So does he. You can lie to him after, but you can't lie to him now. You can't lie to him now because he's moving. Sovereignly, providentially. So you're in this sorting, and this sorting is occurring in multiple levels. It's occurring in my life personally. P. 
people who are in your life that will not, that will not repent and have no intention of repenting, I hate to say this to you, church, that relationship has to go. You can't afford it now. Pray for them. You can pray for them every single day. You just pray for them. You pray and pray and pray and pray. But if they are obstructing what God is trying to do in your life, they got to go. The relationship has to go. You might save them if you quit trying to drag them along. This is a hard thing to preach. I'm for sinners. I love sinners. Y'all know I love sinners. But I'm talking about people that know better. I'm not talking about sinners that have no understanding of what God is or what he's about. I'm talking about people that have rejected him and decided that they're not living like that. They can go ahead and make their own choice, but they can't drown me too. They can drown themselves if they want to, but they can't take me with them. And we're in a time when you've got to get lined up. Politically, I told you, we're going to see a tremendous change politically in the political. This election in 2020 is going to validate my word to you today when I'm telling you God's moving. He's moving. And you're going to see it in election results, and they're going to blame it on, on they can't blame it on the Russians no more. They'll blame it on somebody. They're going to find somebody to blame it on. Let me tell you, they need to look in the mirror. That's who they need to look. That's where they, and I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm for the righteousness of God attaching itself to every seat of our government. That's what I'm for. And God is going to take care of it because they've set themselves up against this sovereign move of God in this time when he's the church. Let me tell you what's happening in the church is the most astronomical thing I've ever seen. You see the United Methodist Church, which has ordained some homosexuals into their deal and, and basically has turned it back, the leadership turned its back. Not everybody in the Methodist Church believe that crap. Don't you think that for one minute? And there's a huge section of the United Methodist Church that has left the church, the Wesleyan Covenant, whatever you call them, Alliance. They have left the Methodist Church because they refuse, they refuse to back off of this right here. Watch in 10 years and see which one of them is still surviving. The Episcopalian Church left, they were thrown out of the Anglican Communion because they were the first one to ordain homosexual churches. And the Anglican Church in Africa, which is the biggest Anglican church, the biggest Anglican church is in Kenya. They said, what are you doing? Well, we've got to come into the modern time. Since when does the modern time exclude the word of God? And they threw them out of the communion. They established their own North American Anglican church, and it's the fastest growing denominational church on the East Coast. Millennials are coming to the Anglican church because they refuse to abdicate the word of God, and they refuse to compromise on truth. And now the, 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 the Episcopalian church, and I'm, I'm, say, I'm not calling nobody out. I'm telling you history. It's in the news. You can get this stuff on the Internet. I read a book called The Myth of the Dying Church by Glenn Stanton. You need to read it. It's a fascinating book. He's a sociologist, and he studied the numbers. And everybody's concluded that the church, and I've been saying this for a long time, everybody's concluded that the church in America is dying. The problem is, is they don't know where to find it. They keep looking in the wrong places for it. And he said the non-denominational church is exploding in America. And the apostate, backslidden churches, like the Episcopalian church, are dying like rats running off a ship. The church is rising up in America, in, in China, in Africa, in Latin America, South America, in Western Europe, the Jesus culture movement in the youth of Western Europe. It's organized around apostolic authority. Bill Johnson has a big, big role in this as an apostolic overseer of this movement. They are winning souls like crazy. And those kids, they just believe every word of the word. Like Roger said, they just decided they're going to believe it. And they're seeing the power of God move. It's not too late for Europe. I've heard all my life in ministry, Europe was a post-Christian continent. It would never be Christian again. Let me tell you something. You better hold your hat, cowboy because you're about to see something as you see a young generation rise up and begin to take you up again for Jesus. Bottom line is this. 
We're in a transitional time of God's sovereign providential intervention into the affairs of men. And now's not the time to be half-hearted in our commitment to him or his kingdom. Now's the time to take your shoes off. I'm not fussing at anybody in here, but I have a responsibility. When God gives me a word, if I don't preach what God gives me, he'll quit giving me anything. To, we can sit up here and tell jokes for half an hour. I'm just telling you, you're caught up in it. You're an important part of this new era of glory that's beginning to be poured out under apostolic alignment in the Midwest, in the South, in all these places. The church is rising up. The church has not only not lost the battle, it's just now really begun to fight the battle. But don't think for one minute. Don't think for one minute. The enemy won't, the enemy won't try to attack you for making the decision that you're going to make this morning to go all in with God. I don't, you know what? I told you something. Somebody prayed for me one time and they said, you know, we know the enemy's been after you. I said, look, I want you to know something. The devil's been after me ever since the day I got saved. The day the devil's not after me anymore, that's when I'll be wondering about what the heck's going on. I'll probably be taking a wrong turn somewhere. I want them to know my name in hell. I want them to know your name in hell because I want them to know that you fought the good fight. And that they're just like the screw tape letters. If you get a chance, you ought to read that book by C.S. Lewis. You know what you need to do? He tells me you should better watch them because anybody that will do what God calls them to do, even when they don't sense his presence, is as dangerous as they can be to the, ki the kingdom of darkness. Where are you this morning is the challenge. Where are you this morning? We're in the midst of a sovereign move of God. He's intervening, and he's going to take out what needs to be taken out, and he's going to raise up what needs to be raised up. Which side are you on? That's what you have to decide. It's time to take our shoes off. Because the commander of the armies of the angels of heaven is here. Amen. And the war has begun. And I want to be on the winning side. How about you?